Hello, good evening, and welcome to the start of a brand new week. It's Monday, which means a bit of comedy. Love some comedy. What have you been up to today? How's your day gone? It, th- the thing is, we're another weekend closer to Christmas now. Uh, have you got your decorations up yet, or would you rather I still didn't talk about it? If you did, that's fine. I'll keep quiet. Thanks for joining me once again for our regular late night visit to those dusty studio archives of old time radio shows right here at my home on the south coast of the United Kingdom. I'm Brett, I'm your host for our Nighttime Podcast. Welcome to another episode. Do please, if you get a minute or two, check out some of our social media, Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. They're all called Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Give us a little follow. And of course, we've got a supporter page at patreon.com forward slash Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Now, you're all here because oh, it's comedy on a Monday and everybody loves a bit of comedy. This one is episode 12, series 5. It's Hancock's Half Hour and the East Cheam Drama Festival. We present Tony Hancock, Sidney James, Bill Kerr, Hattie Jakes and Kenneth Williams in... Hancock's Half Hour. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this week marks the centenary of the East Cheam Festival of Art. Every year, the three great centres of the world of art, Edinburgh, Salzburg and East Cheam, (laughs) rival each other in their productions of the world's greatest artistic masterpieces, drama, music, ballet. In honour of the centenary of the Cheam Festival, tonight the BBC are broadcasting direct from the stage of the Scouts Hall Cheam. (laughs) Excerpts from this year's production. Three short playlets presented by Mr. Hancock and his East Cheam Repertory Company. And to introduce the items we shall hear tonight is the star of the festival himself, Mr. Anthony Hancock. And now the curtain slowly rises to reveal his majestic figure. (laughs) This giant of the English theatre is resplendent in his astrakhan coat, silver-topped cane, plus fours, and carpet slippers. (laughs) He raises his hands for silence and prepares to speak to the audience of all nations. Bonjour, guten tag, bonjour no, buenos dias, or to use my native tongue, watcha. (laughs) It is indeed... A great honour for me to be appearing at this great festival of culture, an engagement I insisted on fulfilling, even though it meant turning down a week's variety at the Metropolitan Edgware Road. (laughs) Tonight, the company and myself give you a triology of three plays, which we will be performing at the festival during the next two weeks. For our first offering, we bring you one of the great masterpieces of the English theatre, a piece with which we of the East Cheam Repertory are proud to have been associated for many years. Jack's Return Home. (laughs) The name part will be played by Mr William Kerr, the great Australian outdoor player. (laughs) Some of you may remember seeing at Her Majesty's Theatre last year, Serving behind the bar. (laughs) Parents will be played by my good self. And Miss Hattie Jakes, who is best known for her sterling performance in Moby Dick. (laughs) When she won all our hearts in the famous scene where she overturned the boat. Mr. Sidney James will be seen as the villainous, unscrupulous, money-grabbing landlord. A role which requires no acting ability on his part (laughs) whatsoever. (laughs) Mr. Kenneth Williams, the celebrated character actor, will be seen in a multitude of parts. A multitude. (laughs) All of which he has pinched from other celebrated character actors. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen... May I present Jack's Return Home. 
Tis thirteen years since our son Jack left this house to seek his fortune in the colonies. I wonder what has become of him. Thirteen years to this very day, Christmas Eve. If only one word would come from him, I could spend my Christmas in peace. Oh, Jack, Jack, are you all right, Jack? <laughs> There, there, Martha, me old darling. Don't go fretting yourself. <laughs> you won't help things are fretting and are worrying like that. Oh, Joshua, you're such a comfort. Ah, should I tell her that this very moment I have in my pocket here a crumpled tear-stained telegram saying as our Jack has been impaled by Zulus. <laughs> now I shall wait till after Christmas, otherwise there will be no grub cooked in this house. <laughs> Moaning and hollering all over the place. Jack's all right, me old darling. You'll see everything will come right in the end. Now, what about getting yourself up out the rocker and giving the old pudding a stir? Do you mind, mate? Give it a rest. No, oh, you're so good to me, Joshua. How glad I am I married you instead of handsome Roger Fisbee. Although he was rich and handsome and you are poor and ugly, I'm still glad I married you, my poor, ugly little husband. <laughs> I'll strangle her one day, sir. <laughs> No, no, me old darling, don't fret yourself. I'm fed up with this part already. <laughs> when it gets to Welsh, I'm packing it up. <laughs> ah, we've been a great comfort to each other through all our long years of poverty while Jack was a boy. And our years of even more poverty while he's been gone. What are you doing, Joshua? Just knocking my old pipe out on the mantelpiece. Uh, Jack used to do that. Jack used to do that. That's all I get in this house. Jack this, Jack that. I can't do anything with that. Jack used to do it. I'm fed up with Jack. I'm glad the Zulu's got him. What's that, Joshua? Oh, nothing, Martha, me old darling, nothing. I was just thinking what a good boy our Jack was. Oh, yes, yes. Dear, dear Jack. Go and put a lamp in his window to guide him home when he returns, Joshua. Ah. Yes, Martha, my dear. I do this every night. Stink the place out these old lads. <laughs> All right, me old darling, I'm just going. Turn it up, mate. It's a drama festival, not a music festival. We've all heard you, we know you can play. Continue, Miss Jakes. Dear Joshua, if only Jack would return home with his fortune made, then he could pay off the mortgage on this little home of ours. Then we wouldn't have to worry about wicked Jasper Stonyheart, the landlord, who even now is trying to throw us out into the snow. I wish he would. I hate this place. <laughs> she likes it here, you see. It reminds her of Jack. It's been a right drag on me, that Jack. If he hadn't come along, I could have been off with that bird across the road. <laughs> Don't worry me, darling. Don't worry me, darling. Dear, kind out and young Jack will come back to help his home. <laughs> Don't worry, darling. Dear, kind out and young Jack will come back to help his old mum and dad in their area of need. How's that pudding going? Dear. <laughs> Who's that, I wonder? It's Jack. It's Jack's return home. <laughs> Tis I, Jasper Stoneyart, the landlord. Oi, what? Get off my foot. <laughs> if you're going to come on leaping in here, watch where you're landing. <laughs> so, huh? Tis I, Jasper Stoneyart, the landlord. I've come for the rent. We can't pay it. We haven't got a penny piece, have we, Joshua? <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> Turn a family out on Christmas Day. I've got to. I've got nowhere to live either. This is the only place I own. And I'm starving and I've got no clothes except the rags I'm standing in. And I haven't got a penny all because you won't pay the rent. I only keep coming in here to mind the rent just to get a bit of warm. Oh, come on, let's have a bit of rent. Just a few bobs so I can get a bite to eat. We haven't got any. Oh, if only Jack were here. He would pay you all the rent we owe you. We could stay on and you could have your money and we'd all live happily ever after. Jack, he won't return home. He's dead. He got impaled by the Zulus. Why, Jack, dead. Jack, gone. Hello, bang goes my Christmas dinner. <laughs> Joshua, is this true? I'm afraid it is, me old darling. I've had a crumpled tears stained telegram in my pocket for two years now. <laughs> saying as our lovable darling little Jack is gone. I haven't dared show it to you all these months. Oh, my Jack, gone, our last hope. Now we have nothing left in the world, no food, no clothes, 
No chap. And no ass. Out by midnight and that's final. <laughs> Wait. You haven't one yet. The insurance I had on the poor lad will be enough to pay you and keep us from want for the rest of our days. Mercy, who can that be at the door? Mother! Father! Tis I, your son Jack. I have returned home. Saved! It is Jack! Pay off the wicked landlord, Jack. I can't, Mother. I'm broke. <laughs> no fortune, Jack? Not a farthing. Not a penny, Father. But I have returned home. Oh, Jack. We thought you were dead. No, Mother. It was the boy next door. I'm not dead. <laughs> well, you are now. <laughs> ah, my old darling, you shot Jack. Yes, and I took out a policy on you as well, so watch it. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have a surprise for you. For 13 years, you thought I am Joshua, your husband. Well, aren't you? No. Stand back while I take my wig off. There. Good heavens! Frederick! Yes, Frederick. What do you say to that, Jasper Stonyheart? I'm not Jasper. I've been wearing this wig and pretending to be Jasper. This is who I really am. There. Good heavens, Jonathan. Yes, Jonathan. I didn't trust either of you, especially you, Martha. And you were right not to, Jonathan, for you see, I am not Martha. <laughs> not Martha? No. There. Now do you recognize me? Gad, tis Gladys. Yes, Gladys. The girl you wronged. And who prays the poor wretch we've killed? Fear not! You didn't kill me. I was saved by my silver cigarette case. There! Do you not recognize me without the wig? Yes, I should have guessed. Ronald. Yes, Ronald, the man you tried to forget. <laughs> well, well. Ronald. Well, well, Frederick. Well, well, Jonathan. Well, well, Gladys. <laughs> well, at least we know now why Jack never returned home. <laughs> Well, he doesn't live here. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure the moral of that play is as true today as it was then. And now there will be a short interval while Mabel and Dolly will pass amongst you with drinks on sticks, nuts in bags and ices in wrappers. <laughs> While we are changing for the next production, coloured lantern slides will be shown featuring some of the products that can be bought from local traders in the high street. I thank you. And as the adverts flash onto the screen, I shall take this opportunity of telling you something about the next offering by the East Cheam Repertory Company, a modern sociological drama written by one of England's leading contemporary dramatists, Mr John Eastbourne. The play is set in middle-class suburbia and deals with a young misfit in society, misunderstood by his parents and the world in general. Dolly, I'll have one of those drinks on a stick, please. Thank you. <laughs> and so, here is the East Cheam Repertory Company in John Eastbourne's Look Back in Hunger. Oh, get him out of here! <laughs> Go on, get back to the bioscope, you rat bag. <laughs> Your indulgence, ladies and gentlemen. The curtain rises, and we see several stagehands pushing the furniture into position. And, uh, <laughs> and the curtain is lowered again. And it's all right. We're ready, Mush. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the curtain rises on a middle-class suburban drawing room. The curtain rises on... Hang on, hang on. The string's gone. <laughs> it's broken. Stop giving the plot away and give us a pull. All right. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I think Fred has managed it. Yes, 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 we're all right uh, now. Carry on, carry on. Thank you. And as the curtain falls right across the middle of the stage, <laughs> we see a middle-class suburban drawing room. Enter Mrs Porter talking to her husband. I don't understand, young Jimmy. He's not like a normal boy, Harold. You must talk to him, Harold. Harold, where are you? Underneath the ruddy curtain, get it off me. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> the end up and you crawl out. I can't see. Where are you? Well, stop thrashing about. I'll thrash you about when I get uh, out. Don't you talk to me like that. I shall report you to the union. It's not my fault the curtain fell on you. Well, get on with it. We can't. He's got caught under the curtain. And now enter the hero. Four minutes too early to help drag the curtain that is coming. You can both come to my office and get your cards when this is over. I will... I've never seen such a disgraceful exhibition on a stage in all my life. It's not our fault. You are no trooper, sir. A real artiste would have pretended it was part of the action and carried on as though nothing had happened. How can you carry on when a dirty great velvet curtain is dropped on your neck? <laughs> you great big-headed lump. Big-headed lump? 
May I remind you that there is an audience out there who can hear every drunken word you're saying. <laughs> oh, belt out. I didn't want to do this acting like in the first place. I wish I'd stayed at home and watched the boxing. Was there some boxing on tonight? <laughs> yeah, some amateur fights. Oh, I wish I'd known. I say, get on with it. Oh, wait. Well, rather. <laughs> come on, Sid, let's whip this through. We might be able to see the last few rounds. We're very unprofessional. We've come to see a play. I'm just conferring with my fellow artiste. I say. Yeah. You don't happen to know what time the boxing finishes? <laughs> well, I say, is there some boxing on tonight? Yes, the amateurs, the police versus the army. A few good punch-ups there, I reckon. <laughs> no scientific stuff or brute force and ignorance. Ladies and gentlemen, John Eastbourne's Look Back in Hunger. I don't understand, young Jimmy. He's not like a normal boy, Harold. You must talk to him. He won't listen to me. He won't listen to anyone. He's angry, Elsie. He's angry. But what's he angry about, Harold? I don't know. He wants a right punch up the bracket, that boy. <laughs> oh, no, it's something more than that, Harold. He's a sensitive boy. He's had a good education. It just doesn't seem to fit in anywhere. Is it our fault? Have we been good parents? Is there anything we haven't done? Only him. <laughs> Don't you worry. I'll lay into him when he gets home. That'll put him right. Mark, I think that's him now. Hello, Sam. Hello, Jimmy. Er, uh, um, uh... Prompt. Hello, Mum. <laughs> Hello, Mum. Er, uh, prompt. <laughs> Hello, Dad. <laughs> Hello, Dad. Er, uh, prompt. <laughs> It's not your turn. <laughs> He's had three weeks off from work to learn this. <laughs> Here, I'll take the script, read the thing. Would you like some tea, Jimmy? Tea, tea, is that your answer to it all? Tea, the panacea of the middle class, the answer to all the problems facing mankind today? Have a cup of tea, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> You both make me sick. You're dead, both of you. You're both mentally dead. Your souls are drowned in tea. Your minds are clogged up with tea bags. You're like two slop basins swimming around in a sea of tea. Just like this country, the whole rotten system stained in a tea of apathy. What's he mean, Mum? I don't think he wants a cup of tea. <laughs> Then. Coffee? Coffee? Is that your only alternative to the stagnant mess that's slowly choking you a cup of coffee? No, we've got some cocoa, I think. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Jimmy boy? Haven't we always done our best for you? Why can't you be content with what you've got? Content? Content with what? You want me to conform, don't you? You want to put a big collar and a bowler hat on me and a best suit on Sundays. Well, I'm not going to conform. I'm not going to get into a rut. I can't be the same as everyone else. Oh, shut up and put your trousers on. different. <laughs> you, you can't choke me. You can't let me rot. You're not going to make me the same as you two. Hey, wait a minute, son. You're sick. You've got everything. You're captain of the darts team. What more do you want? We'll buy you a dartboard of your own. Then you can play here at home. You can invite your little friends round for a cup of tea. Don't you understand? I don't want tea. What do you want, then? I want food. I want food for my mind. Give him a bit of fish, Elsie. That's good for the brain. <laughs> a nice bit of rock salmon, Jim boy. Oh, but why didn't you tell us you like fish? We could have got some in. Well, I'll put my coat on and pop out. I don't like fish. I can't stand fish. I hate fish. Why don't you make up your mind? I'm not eating your fish. It reminds me of her. Those great cod eyes staring at me, dead and glassy. Nothing, nothing going on behind them. Just great glassy cod's eyes. 
Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> she has got cod's eyes when you come to think of it. On them great mutton chop lips. <laughs> yes, that's right. Now you know what I mean. Yeah, you're right, dead right, boy. She is a bit of a horror, isn't she? Oh, that's better. It's nice to see you two getting on together. Another cup of tea, Harold. Tea? Tea? Is that your answer to it all? Tea? Is that your reply to the problem? Young Jim's got a cup of tea. Your mind is befuddled with tea leaves, drugged with cocoa, your senses blinded. Sid! What? PC Harry Street got knocked out in the third round. <laughs> Who did him? Sergeant Harry Trubshaw of the Medical Corps, with his elbow. <laughs> Get on with the play! Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I was getting quite interested. But do carry on. There's no more, that's it. <laughs> That's the end of the play? Yes. A funny place to end. Well, we told you the author doesn't offer a solution, he just poses the problem. But what was the problem? Where can you get a cup of tea at this time of night? <laughs> Thank you so much for Look Back in Hunger. Ah, it wasn't that controversial. Right, that should have been long enough for now to our third offering. And the last play in this trilogy of three is the third one in the programme. <laughs> <laughs> the East Cheam Festival is, of course, not only a drama festival, but also a showcase for the world's greatest music. And so, for his final offering, Mr Hancock's decided to combine the two great arts, Music and theatre, and after a great deal of research, has written, specially for the festival, a dramatised version of the life and work of Ludwig van Beethoven. And here to introduce his masterpiece is the author, Mr. Anthony Hancock. A Danke schön. <laughs> As no doubt Ludwig would have said had he been here today. <clears throat> In preparing this life with this great man, I have naturally included as much of his music as I could, but you will appreciate we are under a slight handicap on account of the pianist has never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> this is no reflection upon the pianist's ability. He is very highly thought of in the saloon bar at the Hand and Racket, <laughs> where, unfortunately, the demand for Beethoven's music is not all it might be. However, I'm sure you will make allowances for this, and so we proudly present our tribute to this great composer. Ladies and gentlemen, the life of Ludwig von Beethoven and the songs that made him famous. Don't you know anything else? <laughs> I gave you the music. Moonlight Sonata. It's on the back of freight train. <laughs> Start again. This is uh, this is one of Beethoven's best-known pieces. You can tell it must have been one of his earlier works by all the wrong notes he put in. <laughs> Ludwig von Beethoven, or Ludo, as we disciples called him, was born in 1770 at Bonn, Germany. A part of Beethoven's dad is being played, and not very well, by Sidney James. <laughs> what is it, Magdalena? We are going to have a baby. Oh, wunderbar, wunderbar. <laughs> wunderbar, wunderbar. Thank you, thank you. We'll let you know, it's quite in order for Mr James to... <laughs> it's quite in order for Mr. James to break into a song like this as Beethoven's dad was an operatic tenor. But I think for the sake of the music lovers, we'd better forget that, don't you see? Yeah, I was looking forward to a bit of the old singing there. <laughs> Look, Heinrich, we have a baby son. Oh, you've had it then. <laughs> well, I couldn't wait for you two to finish arguing. <laughs> Good girl, keep it moving. What shall we call him, Heinrich? What about Fritz? No. What about Carl? No. Kurt. No. What about Ludwig? Time's running out. <laughs> yeah, we will call him Ludwig. Ludwig van Beethoven. Yes, mother? Ludwig, you spoke already. Yes, Ludwig was a child prodigy. 
All day long he composed music. Now I think I'll put this one in between those two lines, a little black one on the second line up, this little round one with nothing in the middle just there, and this black one with the tail hanging down here, a couple of golf clubs here, and a big black one with a dot next to it here. Now, I wonder what that sounds like. Gee, it's easy, isn't it? <laughs> After that, nothing could stop young Ludo and hundred weights of paper poured into the house. And very soon, all over Germany, they were singing... Yeah! This is the Liechtenstein of Polka, my sweet Polka, my sweet Polka. This uh, wasn't one of Beethoven's, but they didn't have time to play it this morning on Housewives Choice, and they asked me if I could possibly... <laughs> They asked me if I could possibly squeeze it in. It was for Mrs. Emily Cravat from her old 80 years friends to remind her of all the happy times they had at the Gunsight Cobham. <laughs> the turning point in Beethoven's career came at the age of nine when he was passing a house in Vienna and he saw a notice in the window. Piano forte taught. Apply inside to Wolfgang Mozart. Piano, five bob, accordion, half a dollar. <laughs> Very soon, Mozart had taught Beethoven all he knew. Yeah, Ludwig, I have taught you all I know. Play something for me. <laughs> yes, he'd taken the half-crown lessons. He didn't have the five bob. <laughs> And so he went back home. Mother, father, I have returned. What have you been doing for 13 years? I have been studying the piano. And what have you decided? It's a big black thing with three legs. <laughs> Heinrich Hassan is a genius. We must send him to Vienna to study. And so Beethoven became more prolific. He bought himself a vamping chart. <laughs> and within a few years, he had written his first sonata. Then came his second sonata. <laughs> then came his third sonata. <laughs> then the fourth sonata. <laughs> I think you could have done with half a crown's worth of Mozart motion. <laughs> that's the only one you know? Oh, don't bother. We'll use gramophone records. Get back to the boozer. Put a pint up for me. I'll be in in a minute. <laughs> After his ninth sonata, he went on to symphonies and wrote nine of those. Then he had to go on to concertos. Just think what he could have done if any he could have counted up to more than nine. <laughs> it was then he bought a ready reckoner and knocked off another 23 sonatas. <laughs> Finally came the crowning glory of his whole career. Glenn Miller recorded his Moonlight Sonata. <laughs> Yes, Beethoven was famous at last. The world acclaimed him and a stone was put on his grave. Busts and photographs of Beethoven could be bought at the foyer together with pictures of the band. And now, as a tribute to this great composer, the assembled players of the East Cheam Repertory Company will now sing the Lichtensteiner Polka. Yeah, he didn't write that. Well, you try and sing his Ninth Symphony, mate. <laughs> right, lads, quick as we can. The pubs are open. That was Hancock's Half Hour, starring Tony Hancock with Sidney James, Bill Kerr, Hattie Jakes and Kenneth Williams. Theme and incidental music composed and conducted by Wally Stott. The show written by Alan Simpson and Ray Galton. The programme which was recorded was produced by Tom Ross. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our latest bit of comedy with Hancock South Hour. And don't forget, we're going to be back with more adventure with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson going live at 5 p.m. GMT. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a supporter page, patreon.com forward slash Brett's Old Time Radio Show. But for now, well, thanks for listening. I'll be with you seven days a week, each and every week, and I'll see you tomorrow on Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Love you. Bye. Bye.